what's up peeps it's me i'm back i hope everybody's doing well i hope everybody is staying safe and i hope everybody's being smart um i'm coming on back so that um we can continue on this series where we're talking about shadow work and we're talking about the shadow self and um i want to bring some more information to you so um like i said i hope everybody's doing well i hope everybody is learning to love yourselves i hope you are learning to give yourself uh compassion you're giving yourself grace you are giving yourself time i hope you are going in deeper and learning more about yourself uh, because this is all about knowing you because you can't really know anything until you know you you can't really know anything about anybody else. You can't really know anything about what's really going on around you until you really know you, until you really know uh, 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 who you are, until you really know what makes you tick, until you really know what you like, what you don't like, uh, until you really know who you are on the innermost parts of you. And, and that's where we get into the shadow. That's where we get into the shadow. And remember, we're understanding that there are two parts of you. There is the persona, which is that part of you, that face that you put on for society, that face that you put on for everybody else, uh, or where you're showing what you think uh, are the best attributes that you have, the best things about yourself. Um, but, that's not, but, but, but that's not who you are uh, at night when you're alone by yourself. And then there's the shadow you. That's that person that there might be things about yourself that you don't like. There may be things about yourself that that, that you find um, uh, disturbing. There may things be things about you that you think are unacceptable to society or unacceptable to your family and your friends or whatever. So you hide those things about yourself and you create this shadow. But in order for you to be the fullness of who you are, you have to become one with your shadow self. You have to learn to embrace your shadow self. You have to learn to go in and, and, and get to know your shadow self and, and explore your shadow self. Explore those things about you that you think aren't acceptable. Explore those things about you that you've tried to hide from yourself and everybody else. Those feelings, those thoughts, those emotions, those events in your life. Because until you delve into your shadow, you can't really know who you really are. Because your shadow self is as much as part, a part of you as that persona that you put out there for the world. So that's the reason why knowing your shadow self, embracing your shadow self, first acknowledging that you have a shadow self. Because we all have one. We all have things about ourselves that we just rather people not know. Uh, we all have, we, we've all done things. We've all thought things. We've all said things that we don't feel good about. You know, things that we felt like we'd be judged on or whatever. And, and we tend to want to hide those things. We tend to want to put those things in the shadow. So we all have a shadow self. We all have to do shadow work. Some people have to do more extensive shadow work than others. Because some people have uh, a tra traumatic things that have happened to them in their past. And because those things were traumatic, because those things made them feel ashamed or made them feel guilty or, or made them feel like they were unworthy or made them feel like they were undeserving or, or made them feel ugly or whatever the case may be, they pushed those things away and hit them in the shadow. So today, I want to get into uh, uh, this theory uh, in, in, in science um, about repression versus suppression, okay? And this has a lot to do with uh, the traumatic events. This has to do with the traumatic things that happened in your, in your, in your, chi in your childhood or in your past. Or, or it might have been something traumatic that just happened last month or two years ago as an adult. But this repression versus suppression has a lot to do with uh, shadow work, okay? So I want to get into that, and I want to get in a, a little bit into the theory of that and um, how this whole thing works, right? So let me go over here. Let me pull up my stuff. All right, here we go. 
Now, this is an article. Hold on, y'all. Let me get my little stuff together. This is an article coming, to, coming from Parenting for the Brain. Parenting for Brain. And this article actually uh, uh, cites its sources. So when you, and I have, and of course I'll have it linked down in the description box. So when you go to this article, you'll see like the ones and the twos and the threes and the fours and all of that, where they actually, at the end of the article, they actually cite their sources, right? And um, I thought it was a very good um, article because it's for parents. And because it's for parents that are dealing with children that may be either uh, repressing or suppressing, um, it's broken down real, real, um, what's the word? What's the word I want to use? It's just broken down. I, I, I mean, it's broken down. Uh, no, not, not a whole lot of big words. You know, it's broken down so that it's easily digestible. That, that, that's the way I want to put it. So that it's easily digestible. And because this whole phenomenon of, 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 of shadow work and, and going in to deal with your shadow self and all of that because it may be very new to some people because it's, it's actually somewhat new to me. Um, we need articles like this. We need information like this that's broken down in a way that's easily digested, that's easily received, that's easy, easy to understand, okay? So um, it says repression versus suppression. What's the difference? By Pamela Lee, La, Lee, last updated January 6, 2024. So this is, this is a very recent article, okay? And let's get into this. The main difference between repression and suppression is that suppression is a conscious effort, while repression is an unconscious strategy to remove unwanted memories or emotion or emotions from a person's mind, right? Okay, so that's the main difference. Repression is something that's internal. It's, in, it's, it's, it's internal. It's something that uh, a, a, an individual person's mind does on its own without this person telling it to do it or without you even being conscious of it. It's something that's done unconsciously by the subconscious mind. That's what repression is. Right? The, uh, the, the, the brain, the mind says, okay, this memory or, or this event or this traumatic experience or, or whatever is going to be so damaging to this person's psyche, to this person's mental health, physical health, emotional health, until the brain itself, without you even being aware of it, the brain itself goes into this process of repressing, restraining, Preventing that memory or, or that emotion or that thought from ever being conscious in your in, in your ever being you ever being aware of it in your conscious mind. So this is something that you do internally, that your brain does internally without you ever being conscious of it. That's what repression is, right? Suppression is voluntary. Suppression is something that you do consciously. It's something that you do deliberately. When you deliberately, consciously, on purpose, decide that you are going to remove an unwanted memory or an emotion or a thought or whatever because you don't like it or because you don't like the way it makes you feel or, or because you, you don't like uh, 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 how the memory makes you feel. You don't like what it's doing to you physically. You don't like what it's doing to you mentally, emotionally. So you consciously, deliberately, intentionally suppress that thought, suppress that memory, push it as far, as far, as far, as far in, in the shadow as you possibly can so that you are not consciously aware of it. So repression is unconscious, 
is something that your brain automatically does without you being conscious of it or being aware of it. It's not something that you're telling your brain to do. You are not even conscious of this whole repression uh, process going on. Suppression is something that you do consciously. You do it deliberately because you don't want that memory. You don't want that emotion. You don't want that thought. You no longer want to be aware of it. You no longer want it to show up in your awareness. So you do, you do it deliberately, right? And another thing about suppression is, not repression, repression is, 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 is all by, suppression is all you. All you by yourself. And it's not something that you are even consciously doing. It's something that your brain decides to do. Because the brain decides that this memory, this event, this emotion, this thought might be so harmful that this person just does not even need it. Does not even need to be aware of it at all. So repression is something that's done internally. Suppression can be done internally, but it's something that you do that you are totally aware that you're doing. You, you are intentionally, deliberately doing it. You are intentionally, deliberately suppressing that thought, that emotion, that memory, that event, that trauma, whatever, right? But suppression can also come from external forces. Suppression can come when you have somebody on the outside telling you, oh, you just need to forget about that. You, you just need to let that go. Oh, you just need to, 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 for, to forget about that. Nothing is going to change. There's nothing that you can do about that situation. So you just need to let that go. You just need to forget about that. Or when, or, or like in, in many cases, when somebody has been uh, abused, whether it's sexual abuse, mental abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse, or whatever, and their abuser is telling them uh, uh, that they have to be quiet, that they have to shut up. That they know better than to tell anybody about what has happened. You know, you're being threatened. You're being told that if you say anything to anybody, that this, that, or the third might happen to you. You understand what I'm saying? So this person is literally suppressing, forcing you to suppress. Forcing you to conceal. Forcing you not to, ex uh, uh, to be able to express Whatever this, 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 this trauma or this emotion or this thought or this event is. So suppression can also, that, that's just like suppression in information. When, with the censorship and all of that that we see uh, 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 in mainstream media when, when, when certain things are talked about and, 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 and certain folk don't want certain things talked about, they suppress the information. They forcibly conceal the information. They force you to be quiet. They force you not to, 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 to say anything about this or to say anything about that. So suppression is something that, yes, can happen. You can do that yourself consciously, deliberately. But suppression can also come from outside forces, from external forces outside of you, outside of your mind, outside of your brain. So that's the difference between repression and suppression. Repression is something that just happens within an individual. And it's not something that this individual does consciously. It's not something that they do on purpose. It's not something that they do deliberately. It's something that their brain, their subconscious mind, does all of its own volition. Right? And, and, and nobody else can repress you. Repression is an individual thing, an internal thing. Suppression can also be an eternal th internal thing, but it's something that you do deliberately. It's something that you do intentionally. You intentionally, you deliberately, for whatever reason, decide that you're going to remove this unwanted memory, this unwanted thought, this unwanted emotion, or whatever from your mind by pushing it as far and as far and as far away as you possibly can. But with suppression, suppression can also come from external forces, from outside forces, from forces outside of yourself and outside of your own mind and outside of uh, uh, your own awareness. 
So suppression can come from outside forces, okay? So that's the difference between repression and suppression. So now that we got that, let me start over. The main difference between repression and suppression is that suppression is a conscious effort. Remember, it's something that you are doing consciously, deliberately, while repression is an unconscious strategy to remove unwanted memories or emotions from a person's mind. Repression and suppression are two psychological concepts that are equally fascinating, but frequently get confused with each other. The definitions and existence of, of phenomena such as repression have been contested over the years. Over a century ago, Sigmund Freud, often called the, follow, the father of psychoanalysis, analysis, proposed that memories can be forgotten by pushing them into the unconscious, a process called repression. Some researchers point out that Freud often used suppression and repression interchangeably. Later, his daughter, Anna Freud, made a clear distinction between them by, by claiming that repression must be unconscious. So it must be something that you're not consciously doing. It must be something that your subconscious mind is doing that you're not aware of. Nowadays, most researchers believe that the two have clear differences, while others describe them as more similar than different. Differences between suppression and repression. People differ in their tendencies to openly show, share, or, con or conceal negative emotions, thoughts, and experiences. Suspr suppression is a conscious strategy that pushes unwanted or anxiety-provoking memories, emotions, thoughts, and desires out of awareness. So this is when you are consciously, suppression is when you are consciously, deliberately pushing that thing out of your awareness. You are deliberately pushing it and pushing it and pushing it and pushing it as far away as you can so that you are not consciously aware of it. So that you forget it, you understand what I'm saying? You block it so much that, that, that it becomes so faded as a memory until it's almost like it's not even your memory at all. It becomes so faded. People may actively suppress unpleasant or uncomfortable feelings by distracting or numbing themselves. And, and this has a source reference. And like I said, if you go down to the end of the article, it'll give you um, the sources that they cited. Unlike suppression, repression is unconscious. Individuals may not consciously know or be aware that they are forgetting or ignoring negative emotions or thoughts. Memory repression is sometimes believed to be the tendency to inhibit the experience of painful feelings or unpleasant thoughts. It is a psychological defense mechanism that can protect a person from overwhelming experiences such as childhood abuse. Which, which, which takes me to this. Um, because as you begin your, your journey for, for, uh, uh, towards doing your shadow work and getting to know your shadow self and going in and exploring these things that you have hidden in the shadow, there may be, there may be some, some truly traumatic, uh, uh, overwhelming experiences, right? And... You may have repressed it to the point where you, you really, really have absolutely no memory of it. But because it's still there, because it's still a part of you, because it's still a part of your psyche, because it's still a part of who you are, and it has not been dealt with, it has not been faced, it's still showing up in your life. It's still showing up in your experiences. So if you decide that you want to go and, and, and you want to have somebody, you know, help you pull up any repressed memories that you may have or whatever, you have to be very, very careful. You have to be very, very careful that you're dealing with somebody that's highly trained in that area, that you're dealing with somebody that knows exactly what they're doing because it's very, very possible. And, and, and there are cases where people have had people remember things that they claim they repressed that never that actually never happened because when you're in that 
kind of deep, uh, 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 unconscious uh, kind of state and people are dealing with your subconscious mind, you have to be careful because if they make any kind of su su suggestion, then somehow or another that suggestion that can can that can can fool you into believing that that's a memory that you repressed. So you have to be careful when you're dealing with pulling up these repressed memories. Okay, I just wanted to put that in there right there. Memory repression is sometimes believed to be the tendency to inhibit the experience of painful feelings or un unpleasant thoughts. It is a psychological defense mechanism that can protect a person from overwhelming experiences such as childhood abuse. Now this is how I say it, they say it works. The subconscious mind is assumed to block unwanted impulses or emotions because they 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 are seen as potentially harmful and disruptive to one's mental well-being, stability, and self-image in situations such as betrayal trauma. And like I said, they got these uh, uh, these different ones cited, and down at the end of the article, they 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 show their sources, right? Um, now here are some similarities between suppression and repression. Emotion similarities between suppression and, and and repression. Emotional repression and suppression are both aimed at avoiding suffering or negative stimuli. Commonly avoided negative feelings include shame, guilt, embarrassment, grief, sadness. Right? And it's no wonder that shame and guilt and embarrassment are the first three. Because usually when we throw these things over in the shadow, when we push these things over in the shadow, these things that we don't want other people to know, these things that we don't, we trying to hide from other people, the things that we ourselves don't want to deal with about ourselves, usually they're somehow attached to shame, guilt, and embarrassment. Those are the three uh, biggest ones. While they were once used as synonyms, a distinction is now made in the role of conscious awareness between the two. Why? Because when you do it consciously, you are consciously aware that you're doing it. You're doing it intentionally, deliberately. The other one, repression, is the one that your subconscious mind does, and it don't need no help from you. It does it without you even being aware of it. Uh, examples of emotional suppression versus repression. Okay, this is um, these are some su su uh, suppression examples. A husband holds back tears at his wife's funeral because men are expected to be strong. That's him deliberately, consciously, intentionally suppressing his emotions because he's been taught. That men are supposed to be strong and they're not supposed to express their emotions like that. Right? A survivor refuses to talk about a fatal car accident that killed her best friend to avoid bringing up painful memories into the conscious mind. So her refusal to even talk about it, to even think about it, is how she suppresses these painful memories. After an emotionally draining breakup, the woman pretends to be fine in front of her friends, even though she's hurting inside. She's deliberately repressing her emotions because she doesn't want people to know how she's really, really feeling inside. It may be because she don't want to burden her friends. You understand what I'm saying? Or it may be because, you know, she don't want to deal with the guilt and the shame or the embarrassment or whatever as far as the breakup is concerned. But she's deliberately suppressing. All of these are examples of somebody deliberately, consciously suppressing, uh, suppressing emotions or thoughts or feelings or whatever that are painful that they don't want to have to deal with. Right? This is repression. These are examples of repression. Despite feeling that he should, a husband cannot feel sorrow at his wife's funeral, but doesn't know why. He knows he should be feeling it, but he can't understand why he can't feel it. 
is because his subconscious mind has repressed that thing, has pushed that thing down so that he won't feel the pain of it. So that he won't feel that gripping sorrow and that gripping grief. Right? The survivor of a fatal car accident that killed her best friend is unable to talk about the incident because she cannot recall the traumatic memories. So she can't even remember. She can't talk about it because she can't remember it. Why? Because her subconscious mind has pushed that thing so far down to keep her from remembering, from being traumatized by those memories. Right? A woman seems fine despite an emotionally draining breakup and feels blank when it comes to the recall of memories related to it. So even though it was an emotionally draining breakup, she seems to be all right. Why? Because even when she tries to remember, even when she tries to think about it, even when she tries to bring it up in her memory, she can't because her subconscious mind has repressed that thing to keep her from feeling that pain, to keep her from feeling uh, 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 that trauma from those memories. So that's the difference between suppression and repression, right? Let's go a little further. Effects of suppression versus repression. Both mechanisms and both are defense mechanisms when you use them yourself, right? They are defense mechanisms. Um, on the other hand, when we're talking about outside forces coming in to suppress, to force you not to talk about something, to force you not to remember something, to force you uh, 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 not to rec uh, recall or share your trauma or your emotions or whatever. That's usually a defense mechanism too. But that's that person over there trying to defend themselves more than likely. They're not worried about defending you. It's not a, a defense mechanism to protect you. It's something that they're using against you to protect themselves, right? Um, both mechanisms serve to uh, manage distressing emotions, but operate at different levels of consciousness. As a result, they have distinct impacts on emotional, mental, and physical well-being. Emotional experience. Suppre suppression. Individuals who use chronic suppression of emotions can experience less positive and more negative emotions than others. Why? Because that's all they do. All they do is walk around all day long using to, uh, suppression to, to suppress their emotions. So now they're not even getting the opportunity to experience positive emotions. Why? Because they have now become almost addicted to su suppression. Almost addicted to deliberately, intentionally suppressing any emotions that they have. Right? Repression. Emotional repressors experience fewer negative emotions than people who do not repress their emotions. They also experience sim similar levels of positive emotions as other people. They also appear to be, this is the key, they also appear to be optimistic and upbeat. Why? Because repression, the, 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 the subconscious brain has almost pretty much wiped that whole thing off of your off of your consciousness. Right? So yeah, you, you might experience fewer negative emotions than most people who don't repress their feelings. Right? And you also experience positive emotions pretty much at the same level as other people. And you appear to be optimistic and upbeat. You appear to be normal, everything is good, you straight, you all right. But that stuff is still in your shadow. So it's going to come up somewhere in your life. Because it's still a part of you. Mental health. Suppression. It is, it is associated with decreased mental well-being. So people who practice the suppression, who practice suppressing intentionally, deliberately uh, 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 suppressing their emotions, their feelings, their thoughts, whatever... It is associated with decreased mental well-being. Repression. Despite appearing optimistic and upbeat, a repressive coping style is considered psychologically unhealthy. 
People with repressed memories may also experience extreme fight or flight responses. Why? Because even though you've wiped it, even though, even though your subconscious mind has wiped it from your consciousness, has wiped it from your immediate awareness, it's still there. That memory is still there. And it's causing a heightened in this fight or flight response. As soon as something happens, probably almost immediately, you go into fight or flight. You understand that the adrenaline gets to rushing and, and all kinds of stuff, you know, your cortisol levels go to, go to rising and all of that. Why? It's because that experience is still a part of you. Physical health, suppressing. So, so th this is the, su the, the suppressive person. Linked to an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and a higher possibility of earlier death. Repression. While downplaying their anxiety or stress, emotional repressors may still feel repressed emotions in their body. Why? Because it's still a part of you. It's still there. And it has not been dealt with. So you're still feeling the stress of it. They are also associated with higher risk of heart attack and mortality. So because these experiences, just because you're repressing them or suppressing them, doesn't make the experience go away. It doesn't make, the memory might not be right there uh, 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 in, your, in your immediate conscious awareness, but, the, it's still, but it's still a part of you. It's still a part of your entire makeup. It's still a part of your DNA. That memory is still in your cells. So in order for you to really deal with it, you're going to have to go and you're going to have to face that memory head on. Social and interpersonal relationships. This is for the suppressor. Often results in poor, poor interactions and relationships with others as it hinders genuine emotional connections with others. How are you going to have a genuine emotional connection with somebody when you're constantly trying to suppress your emotions? You can't. Repressors. While many emotional repressors are viewed as valuing a rational, non-emotional approach to life, they, they tend to show an avoided attachment style in their rom romantic relationships. Why? Because even though it's repressed, even though you can't remember it, even though you can't recall it to your conscious mind and into your awareness just like that, it's still a part of you. It's still a part of you and your body, uh, 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 your, even your subconscious mind is still reacting to it. It says a final note on the debate of repression. Like many others, the field of, psych uh, of, of psychology is constantly evolving and changing. Therefore, repression, a subconscious defense mechanism, continues to be hotly debated with practitioners and researchers taking alternate sides. For the majority of people, concepts and research on suppression and repression are helpful reminders to take practical steps toward handling our emotions better. Whether it is finding effective ways to regulate or working through unresolved trauma emotionally, it is ultimately worthwhile to healthily manage emotions and experiences rather than trying to shove them away. And like I said, at the end of this article, it cites uh, all the sources that they used, right? And I thought that was a very good, very basic, uh, very fundamental, very easy to understand article so that we can understand the difference between repression and suppression, okay? And like I said, of course, that article will be listed down in the description box so that you can refer to it and you can actually refer to some of these sources that they cited in this article, right? Um, so understand that repression can also, repression and suppression can also add to that shadow. 
You understand what I'm saying? That's the reason why you have this shadow. And that's the reason why your shadow self is growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. Why? Because you're either intentionally, deliberately suppressing stuff. Or because the experience is so traumatic. You understand what I'm saying? Your, 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 your conscious, your subconscious mind is going in and handling this process as a defense mechanism to keep you from, uh, from having to consciously think about it and consciously relive it. So repression and, supp and suppression add to the shadow, right? When you have this third party or these outside influences coming in and forcing you or try to force you to suppress emotions or, or traumatic experiences, events or whatever. That adds to your shadow. That adds to that shadow self. Right? Now when we talk about children, let, let's go in because this was parenting for brain. So this was something that that that, that was uh, uh, basically so, uh, uh, around parents understanding uh, uh, how certain things work as far as their kids are concerned. But 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 that that's for everybody. The first thing, and first and foremost, is we're gonna have to keep the children safe. That's the first and foremost. As parents, as grandparents, uh, 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 as a village, as uncles and aunts, as 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 as. Uh, God, parents, however you want to look at it, as, 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 as society as a whole, we're going to have to learn how to keep children safe. That's just the bottom line. We're going to have to get better at keeping children safe so that these experiences won't happen to them in the first place. Okay, but let's say, for instance, we, saw, we find ourselves in a position where, for whatever reason, we just couldn't protect this child and something traumatic happened. Whether it was an abuse on, on some level or whatever, something traumatic happened to this child. What we're going to have to do is we're going to have to hurry up and get that child as soon as there's even any inkling or even even or even the first signs that something has happened. We're going to have to get that child. We're going to have to get that child and get that child into a safe environment, an environment where the child feels safe. An environment where the child feels secure and feels protected and feels loved and feels a certain level of trust so that that child can open up and release that trauma. How does that child release that trauma? Well, they release that trauma by sharing the experience. They release the trauma by sharing what happened. By telling what happened, who did it, when they did it, where they did it, and giving as much detail as that child possibly can. But that's not going to happen unless that child is in an environment where they feel safe, where they feel secure, where they feel protected, where they feel loved, where they don't feel any shame, where they don't feel any guilt, where they know there's not going to be any judgment, where they know they're not going to be blamed for anything. So we have got to have more and more and more and more environments for children like that. So that when these things happen, when we've done all we can do to protect them and something like this still happens, we can immediately get them in the proper environment so that they can open up and they can release the trauma. And they won't have to go through the process of repression. Or suppression. You understand what I'm saying? Or be subjected to some third party coming in trying to suppress them. Trying to force them to be quiet. Trying to force them to forget. And once they have released that trauma. And because they are dealing with people that love them. They are dealing with people that are not going to blame them. They are dealing with people that will protect them and give them whatever help they need. They can go ahead on and they can work through this trauma. And they don't have to worry about repressing it or suppressing it or anything else. Then that becomes a healthier individual. Now that child can heal as a child. And it's not 30, 40 years later that that, child is, 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 that that child is now an adult and experiencing all of this stuff in their life because they have all of this hidden drama 
and all these suppressed or repressed or whatever emotions that they've been hiding in their shadow and now they got to go through doing all this shadow work. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. A lot of adults now who are dealing with trauma, who are dealing with uh, emotional trauma, mental trauma, physical trauma. They're dealing with uh, uh, bad memories. They have they, they have either been repressing or suppressing or whatever. A lot of them would have been a, 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 a lot farther along on the healing journey if they had just had somebody that they could talk to. If, had, if as an adult, if as a young adult, a teenager, a young adult, someone in their 20s or 30s, if they had just had some place where they could go or somebody that they could go to where they felt safe, where they felt protected, where they felt secure, a place where they could go and share their experience, share their truth, share their trauma. Without having to worry about being judged. Without having to worry about feeling embarrassed. Or feeling uh, uh, shame. Or feel, feeling guilt. If they had just had somewhere to go. Where they could just unload that thing. Release that thing. By opening up their mouths. And speaking on it. Opening up their minds. And remembering. So that they could speak on it. And release it. Without having to worry about, like I said, being shamed or being or, or feeling guilty or being judged or whatever. So we are going to have to do better as a healing community. We are going to have to do better about providing these safe spaces and these safe places where not only children but also adults can come and they can share their trauma. They can release that trauma without having to worry about being judged. Because once you have released that trauma, once you have, uh, 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 you have opened up, you have opened up your heart, you have opened up your mind, and, and you're releasing it, you're letting it out of you. You are removing it from your heart space. You are removing it from your mind space. What somebody else thinks no longer matters. The only thing that matters is now that you have released it, now that you have had an opportunity to unburden yourself with it, now that you have had an opportunity to separate it from you, and now in, in and now no now it's not just in you. Now it's out there, and because it's out there, you can look at it a different type of way. How do you feel? So we've got to get to that place where that's the question that we ask people. Doesn't matter how you feel about what they just shared with you. It doesn't matter how you feel about their trauma or their experience or, 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 or their emotion or their thought or whatever ever, ever it was that they were releasing. Doesn't matter how you feel about it. What matters is how do they feel about it? Now that you have released it. Now that it's no longer in you, but it's out here and you can look at it a different type of way. Because it's out there. It's no longer hiding in the shadow. Now it's out here in the light of day and you can look at it. Now how do you feel? That's the question we've got to start asking people. And we've got to start providing people with a safe place and a safe space where they can come and they can release this stuff. Children, uh, young adults, teenagers, grown folk, men, women, it doesn't matter. Because we have got to decide if we want to be a part of the healing solution or if we want to continue to be a part of the trauma bonding and, and the problems. Now, once they have released that thing, 
Once they have had a chance to get it outside of them, now they have a chance to look at it and see it for what it really is. Now it's not this uh, a scary thing that's, 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 that's hiding in the shadows and they scared to deal with it. Now that they have spoke on it, now that they have remembered it, now that they have put it outside of them and it's out there and they can look at it and they realize, okay, well, maybe it's not as scary. Maybe it's not as bad. Maybe it's not as big. Maybe it's not as frightening as you thought it was. Yes, there may come a moment when we have to deal with them taking responsibility for some things. Them expecting, uh, uh, um, them accepting responsibility for some things or whatever. But that comes after the fact. That comes after they have been able to release it with no judgment. And then we have to make sure that they understand that not only are you not getting any judgment from me, but you shouldn't judge yourself. Don't be too hard on yourself. Give yourself some grace. Give yourself some compassion. But if, as folks who are all about healing and who are all about solutions, we are going to have to start being able to provide these spaces for folks so that they can heal. Because the more folk we have on this planet that are healed or are on their healing journey or have started the process of healing or whatever, the better off we all are. That makes a better world for all of us. So that's the reason why it's imperative that all of us become a part of the healing process. We all become a part of the healing solution. Because the more folks we get healed, the better off we all are. So that's just what I wanted to bring y'all. Again, I just want to recap. Make sure that we understand that repression is something that is done internally, unconsciously, without the individual knowing it. The subconscious mind just automatically kicks in because this event or uh, this traumatic experience, this painful, these painful memories or whatever, the, the brain feels like it's just going to be too harmful for to this person's well-being, then the subconscious, unconscious mind, the subconscious mind just automatically kicks in and starts doing whatever needs to be done to repress this memory, to repress uh, uh, this event, to repress these emotions, to repress these memories. And the conscious mind, that person is not even consciously aware that this whole process is taking place. That's repressing. Suppression is when you do it consciously. You do it on purpose. You do it deliberately. Deliberately, you go in and you push these memories, these experiences, these thoughts, these emotions as far and far and far and far away as you possibly can until it gets to the point where, like I said, that memory can be can become so faded that it's not even it's not even your memory anymore. That's suppression. And remember, with suppression, a third party can also be responsible for suppressing you. For, for trying to force you to suppress a memory, trying to uh, uh, force you to suppress an event, to suppress an emotion. Don't say anything about it. Don't speak on it for whatever reason. So that's the difference between repression and suppression. So that's just what I wanted to bring y'all today. I didn't want to stay here too long, but I wanted to bring y'all this information so that we would have just a little bit more information as far as uh, shadow work is concerned and some of the elements of shadow work and some of the stuff that's involved in doing shadow work. Um, the article, like I said, will be listed down in the description box. So if you want to go read the article, read the article. And like I said, they have cited their sources. So you might even want to go and do some of your own research and actually check into some of the sources that they cited in this article. Um, 
uh, uh, of course, the information as far as the uh, the channel is concerned, the uh, the PayPal's, the Cash Apps for Healing Legacy um, are, are in the description box. If you want to support the channel in that way, uh, you're welcome to do that. Uh, I'm I'm just glad that you're here. I'm just glad for your views. Uh, let's get the likes up. Uh, if you if you're not subscribed to the channel, subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell notification so you can be notified when we upload videos. But yeah, it's all about loving yourself. It's all about getting to know yourself. It's all about you becoming a whole person. And you can't be a whole person if you're hiding from yourself in the shadows. So that's the reason why shadow work, understanding about shadow work, understanding what shadow work is, understanding what a shadow self is, that's the reason why uh, all of that is so important. But please uh, take care of yourselves, love yourselves. Uh, like I said, get in that mirror, look in that mirror, doesn't matter whether this is how you feel or not, you get in that mirror and you do it anyway. And you keep doing it and you keep doing it and you keep doing it. You have to be persistent. You have to be determined. You have to be dedicated. You get in that mirror and you tell yourself that you love yourself. And every day, you come up with at least one reason why you love yourself. Then the next day, you come up with two reasons. Then the next day, you come up with three reasons. Gratitude is very important. Finding something to be grateful for. Finding something to be thankful for about yourself, about your circumstances, about your life is very important. But love yourself, loving yourself, giving yourself grace, giving yourself mercy, cutting yourself a break is very important when you're doing shadow work. It's important anyway, but it's really important when you're doing shadow work. So love yourself, take care of yourself. Do a little self-care, uh, uh, even if you only set aside one, one, one day a week. Or maybe a couple of hours one day a week to just take care of yourself. Whether it's doing your nails, doing your hair, uh, uh, fellas, whether it's getting your, 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 uh, your going to the barber shop and getting your, your face done up or whatever. Just, just whatever is self-care for you, do that for yourself. Treat yourself. Do something that makes you feel special. Something that's just for you. Because we cannot love each other, we cannot take care of each other like we're supposed to until we love and take care of ourselves. So love yourself, take care of yourself, let's love each other, let's take care of each other. Um, like I said, if you want to be a part of this healing movement, because that's what I'm on now, I'm on this kick about healing. It's a healing movement now. And you want to be a part of it. And you want to support it. Support the channel. Like I said. Uh, uh, the the uh, uh, Healing Legacy now has its own cash app. So if you want to go to cash app. And support Healing Legacy in that way. So that we can continue to work. Because I'm going to be announcing something new. That's coming from Healing Legacy. Uh, uh, it, it may be this week. If not this week. It will be next week. Because I'm really really serious. About this healing thing. So just support healing in any way that you can. Share this information. Uh, uh, like I say, don't just share this on social, on social media, but share it with your family, share it with your friends, share it with anybody that's willing to listen, anybody that wants to be a part of the solution and no longer a part of the problem. All right, and I love you guys, and I'll talk to you guys later.